Hello, friends. Mm. Where's that book? Uh, <clears throat> uh, this is a uh, wake up and think clearly about. Early Christian thought. Mm. Let's see. So, let's take a look at Jesus and his disciples. <clears throat> the life and teaching. Jesus of Nazareth were conditioned by the prevailing unrest that marked the Palestine of his day. Impatience of foreign control was widely felt and the spirit of nationalism was, was growing ever stronger and more bitter. When, res when result was what might have been expected in any country similarly circumstanced. The outbreak from time to time of armed revolts, 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 put down by the authorities with a heavy hand authorities with a heavy hand they were put down <laughs> another result peculiar to the Jews was the recrudescence and growing currency of the ancient hope of a golden age to come when the nation, <clears throat> not by its own efforts, by th but by the interposition of God, God with a capital G, God, should be set free from the dominion of the heathen and enjoy an era of peace, prosperity, and glory. Then the God of Israel would reign supreme and righteousness be everywhere established. Sometimes the hope was nationalistic to the last degree and put in the forefront political independence and material well-being. Sometimes it was of a more spiritual character. A more spiritual character. And emphasized chiefly or exclusively the righteous rule of God and complete obedience to him. Hmm. Let's take a look at this. Let's let's flip the uh, the phone camera and show you what I'm reading. I'm reading chapter one, Jesus and his disciples. I just finished reading the first paragraph, so you can take a screenshot of this maybe and read along. From what book am I reading? <clears throat> Good question. Let's take a look. A History of Christian Thought by Arthur Cushman MacGriffert. Oh, MacGiffert. Gifford? Or is that 
Gifert. No, I don't think so. Well, if if it's Giffords, shouldn't they have a, a U there? G-U-I-F-F-E-R-T? <clears throat> I don't know. Let's see. Volume 1, Early and Eastern. From Jesus to John of the Damascus. Charles Schribner's Sons publication, New York in London, 1932. Uh, other books by Arthur Cushman McGifford. Uh, he wrote The Gods of the Early Christians. No, The God of the Early Christians. The Rise of Modern Religious Ideas, Martin Luther, The Man and His Work, Protestant Thought Before Kant, The Apostles' Creed, A History of Christianity in the Apostolic Age, The Church, History of Eusebius, Dialogues Between a Christian and a Jew. <laughs> So this is volume one, Eastern, no, early and Eastern. So let's read on. In the generations just before and after Jesus, the hope, the hope found eloquent expression in various apocalyptic writings with dif which differed in many ways but were at one in their confident predictions of the coming of the new and better age. There were those to be sure who did not share this hope, some who were well content with things as they were, desired no divine intervention. Others who would have, would have, uh, would have, others who would have welcomed it. Let me flip the camera. There we go. Others who would have welcomed it but saw no reason to expect it. But in spite of indifference and skepticism, in many quarters, uh, the hope was very much alive in Jesus' day. Jesus apostrophe without the S because it already has an S, so it's just Jesus' day. <clears throat> Jesus' apostrophe day. <clears throat> and did not a little to determine his career. Did not a little to determine his career. He, too, shared it. Who is this he? Jesus? He, too, shared it in its more spiritual form. And he not only looked forward to the new and better age, but he was convinced that it was immediately at hand. Wherever he may have got this conviction, whether it came to him gradually as he studied the prophets and reflected upon the evils of the age, or was due to some external influence like the preaching of John the Baptist, and at any, at any rate, it took such possession of him that he felt himself called upon by God to proclaim it publicly as John was doing 
and to carry the proclamation far and wide. John was content to remain in the desert and preach to the people that flocked thither, thither, T-H-I-T-H-E-R. Jesus did not wait, wait. Jesus did not wait for them to come to him, but went about along the towns and villages, delivering his message wherever there were those to listen. Man. They didn't have internet. He, uh, he didn't sit down on his laptop to create a website or, or make podcasts or get on social media, get on Facebook, on YouTube, on uh, TikTok, on, hmm, on X. No, he didn't have that. He had to walk from town to town. And the towns were separated, who knows, 20, 30, 40 miles apart. He had to walk whole day to get to the next town. So he would go town to town and all the towns and villages and deliver his message wherever there were those to listen. He must have been annoying Hearing someone in the middle of the market talking out loud, trying to get people to listen to him. Unfortunately, Jesus left no writings, and we must depend for our knowledge our gnosis, our knowledge of his teaching on the reports of his followers embodied more or less revised and edited in our three synoptic gospels. Three synoptic gospels. What happened to the fourth gospel? Are you saying that one of them is not synoptic? Oh. Which one is the one that's not synoptic? We'll find out. Though we cannot always be sure of his words, as recorded in those Gospels, at second or even third and fourth hand, we can at least form a fairly accurate picture of his controlling interests and of the spirit and general principles of his teachings. Of his teaching. Singular. Teaching. Hmm. Okay. So, let's take a look at his teaching. So, his message had two aspects. It was at once a promise and a warning. Warning, warning, promise, promise. Let's evaluate the the promise and the warning. So was the warning that the kingdom of God is at hand and was the promise also that the kingdom of God is at hand in other words that it was coming and I promise you that so the warning would be get ready because the kingdom of God is at hand uh, and be good and all that 
And then the promise is it's, it's coming, but it never came. Or did it? We'll find out. What did he think? So, what what did he uh, what what did he mean by promise? A promise and a warning. Let's find out. He, what? Well, let me let me show you what's written on this book. Let's see. So, I'm down here. Well, you can take a screenshot of this whole page that I've read. Let's see. In case you want to make sure I read everything correctly. Mm-hmm. Got it? Trying to not shake. So, uh, I started reading the last paragraph where it said his message. So his message had two aspects. It was at once a promise and a warning. He proclaimed the gospel or good news of the speedy coming of the kingdom or reign of God so longed for by many. And at the same time warned his hearers of the divine judgment which was to attend its coming when some would be found worthy to share its blessings while others were condemned and cast out. He announced the approach of the kingdom, not simply that man might hail it with rejoicing, but that they might repent and amend their, amend their lives and thus be fitted for the righteous rule of God. Like John the Baptist, he judged his generation rigorously and was profoundly convinced of the need of a reformation. He was especially severe upon the religious leaders of the day. Their hypocrisy, pride, and arrogance he denounced in unsparing terms. He condemned them also because... In their ignorance of the true will of God, they were deceiving the people and leading them astray. Blind leaders are the blind. They were hurrying both themselves and others to destruction. Let me flip over again. So, but, um, but, are these visions, are these imaginations of a kingdom of God, are they uh, are they do they involve the establishment of a kingdom f only for Israel or for the whole world. There's no way that they were thinking that this was going to involve a kingdom for the whole world. Maybe a kingdom for all of uh, the Roman Empire, as in converting the Roman Empire into a kingdom of God, but the only kingdom at that time, I would say, would be, is, I wouldn't say Israel, I would say Judea, Judea, Judea? Yes, I would call it Judea now, I am, I've learned. Okay, so, so what did, Jesus and John the Baptist have in mind were they convinced that this kingdom would would take over the 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 government that was in place I don't know it was like 
it was it was like Rome had placed perhaps placed Pontius Pilate, but also Herod. Herod was was a Jewish kind of governor or king, whatever. And Pontius Pilate was the Roman uh, governor. So maybe, so it seemed like they had two things going, one on top of the other. Perhaps King Herod had two... Uh, obey what Pontius Pilate or was to say or was it that they had a, a deal that that uh, King Herod would would uh, sort of control his people as long as uh, they maybe paid taxes to the Roman uh Emperor Empire. I don't know. It was. It's a strange setup. <sighs> so, I don't see anything spiritual about having a kingdom of God. This is material. This is like political. It's all political. There's nothing spiritual here. And that uh, because it's coming, that you had to uh, re repent and amend your your ways, and so so be so that you would be fit for the righteous rule of God. So there would be a a God ruling kingdom. God is a king. <sighs> so th at this time does does Jesus go around saying I am going to be the king? No, he just talks about the kingdom of God, so that means that God would be the king. So but that that goes uh, all against the idea of a messiah. A messiah should should be a king, a Jewish king to to bring about a kingdom for the Jews. There is no, there's no. Uh, they're not conceiving that this kingdom of God would rule all of Earth. There's. That's inconceivable. This little area, little corner of the world, Judea, Judea, where we have Jerusalem there, it's being controlled by Rome, right? How can you expect that they're actually expecting it to happen in their lifetime? They're not saying the kingdom of God is coming in about 3,000 years, so get ready. No, they're saying it is at hand as in 5, 10 years. It's, so we've got to get ready, got to hurry up. Hmm. <sighs> so... Jesus left nothing undone to bring home to his hearers the seriousness of the impending crisis. Impending. What is the impending crisis? Is it within a year or two? I guess it's it's a good it's a good um, attitude to um, hurry up and wait, to, to hurry up and uh, get your act together, it's better than not doing anything. 
So I guess Jesus was motivating his people to what? To get to repent and amend their lives to be fit for a righteous rule of God as king of a kingdom on earth. Right? This is not to get ready to die and then go live in the kingdom of God in heaven. There's no mention of heaven, is there? Not so far, no. Uh, he, he was not ascetic either in his living or in his teaching, but he insisted that nothing else was of any consequence in comparison with the kingdom. Possessions, friends, family, all the ordinary responsibilities and obligations of life counted for naught in the face of the approaching consummation. He declared that unless one hated father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, one could not be his disciple. You mean you have to hate your mother, father, brothers and sisters, and then you can be his disciple? He, this is outrageous. This is, and to the man who wished to perform the filial duty of burying his father, he sternly replied, Let the dead bury the dead. This is incredible. This is not, this is not cool. Can you imagine somebody going around talking like this? Today, he would be put in jail or uh, beat up, I don't know, to such utterances as representing his general attitude, touching men's duties towards, toward their fellows, is of course to m misunderstand them as his insistence on love for one's neighbor abundantly shows. So, there's a little bit of a conflict here. So there's like, uh, hmm, there's an attitude of uh, renunciation but renunciation to follow him, and then at the same time, there's a an attitude of of love for uh for one's neighbors. So. So what's going on? So, here it says that. This author says that these uh, extreme uh, attitudes were meant to impress upon those whom he addressed the strenuousness and immediacy of the crisis. There is a crisis. Immediacy. Immediacy, that means it's, it's here. But it never happened. There was no kingdom of God. There was no kingdom of God to to liberate uh, Judea and Jerusalem. No God was put on the throne. Instead, Jerusalem was destroyed. So this is a failure. What, what happened? Where did they go wrong? It was a, a failure of incredible proportions, and yet this failure becomes a success. 
it was for the same reason that he emphasized over and over again the sternness of the divine character. God, that's God with a capital G, he insisted the God whom they worshipped as well as he was not a fond and indulgent parent. He was a strict judge who would take vengeance upon the wicked and exact the uttermost penalty from the unrighteous. This is incredible. This is outrageous. How can this guy sell his religion? A religion of a stern, not, not an, a fond and indulgent parent, but a strict judge who would take vengeance upon the wicked and exact the uttermost penalty from the unrighteous. But did he? Did he actually do those things? Did this God take vengeance upon the wicked? Where is there evidence of this God taking vengeance upon the wicked and exacting the uttermost penalty from the unrighteous? Jesus, of course, believed, as all Jews did, that God is gracious and merciful as well as righteous. He took for granted that God could forgive, not simply punish, when he found the assurance of divine forgiveness needed, he was quick to offer it. But he evidently felt that too many of his countrymen were presuming on God's goodness and that what they chiefly required was not the promise of forgiveness but the warning that they must not expect to be forgiven unless they too forgave. The warning that they must not expect to be forgiven. What about expecting to go to heaven? There's a lot of people that expect to go to heaven. They say they've been saved. So they expect to go to heaven. Isn't that the same as expecting to be forgiven? So this Jesus guy was trying to get people to not expect to be forgiven. So if he were around today, wouldn't he also be expecting people? No. Wouldn't he be trying to get people to not expect to be going to heaven because he was trying to get people to not expect to be forgiven. Isn't that the same? When you're forgiven of all your sins, then you go to heaven because you don't have any sins, right? So you go automatically go to heaven. So people, I'm talking about, Christians that say that they've been saved, they seem to expect to be going to heaven. I imagine, I don't know, I get uh, the impression that that is so. So they are expecting to go to heaven because they believe they've been saved. So they're, they're good to go. Huh. That they must expect to be treated mercifully unless they too were merciful. Oh. So here's the condition. You should not expect to, to be treated mercifully unless you too were merciful. Also, you should not expect to be forgiven unless you too forgave. So you got to be 
forgiving others and being merciful with others. <clears throat> hmm. It's, let's find out more. Oh, let me um, take a, allow you to take a screenshot of the, the page I, I've been reading. Uh, this one here, where it says, G -G that as all Jews did, that God is gracious and merciful. So Jesus believed, as all Jews did, that God is gracious and merciful, as well as righteous. So on. So I've been reading this top paragraph. Uh, so take a screenshot of it if you, if you want. Wait a minute. Let me make sure I get it all in. Well, I haven't read the bottom part of it. Yeah, that might be a good shot right there. Anyway. Let's flip it back to my face. Enjoy looking at me uh, uttering the words. <clears throat> so, where was I? Let me reread re this important sentence. Well, no, let's read these two past sentences. He took, mm, he took for granted that God could forgive not simply punish and we and when he found the assurance of divine forgiveness needed he was quick to offer it uh this uh this book or this author does not uh, does not follow the modern standards maybe <laughs> Of uh, capitalizing he the the pronouns uh, the pronouns referring to God, uh, they today, I guess maybe they didn't back then, nineteen thirties, they didn't capitalize he when referring to God. So I think today they would capitalize. Well, maybe uh, there. This uh, this sentence is is tricky because we're talking about Jesus and God, so and they're both male. So the so the this sentence has uh, mentions he Jesus did uh, look at God in this way. God and then and then uh, within the same sentence another pronoun he and then another pronoun he but <clears throat> when I read it uh, I, I, I replaced the he with the he the pronoun he with God maybe I should have pr replaced it with Jesus uh, so I have to analyze this sentence. He took for granted, that's talking about Jesus. So I can just say, Jesus took for granted that God could forgive, not simply punish. And when he found the assurance of divine forgiveness needed, he was quick to offer it. Now, this second part of the sentence has two he's. When he found the assurance of divine forgiveness needed, he was quick to offer it. So, which he goes with which God, as, in, as if the Trinity were three gods. Which person is he talking about here? Okay, let's start from the beginning of this sentence. He took for granted that, that God could forgive, not simply punish. That's referring, that he is referring to Jesus. Comma. And when he found the assurance of divine forgiveness needed, he was quick to offer it. 
And when he found the assurance of divine forgiveness needed, he was quick to offer it. And when he, who is this he? And when Jesus found the assurance of divine forgiveness needed, Jesus was quick to offer it? No, Jesus doesn't offer divine forgiveness. It's God. So that means that this second part of the of the sentence is saying, and when God found the assurance of divine forgiveness needed, God was quick to offer it. Or maybe it's, it's and when Jesus found the assurance of divine forgiveness needed, God was quick to offer it. <sighs> I'm not sure anymore. But he, that, that might be Jesus, he evidently felt that too many of his, that's definitely Jesus, of his countrymen were presuming on God's goodness and that what they chiefly required was not the promise of forgiveness, but the warning that they must not expect to be forgiven unless they too forgave, that they must not expect to be treated mercifully unless they too were merciful. Okay, I, I get it. It was not the preaching of divine forgiveness that seemed to him chiefly demanded in the circumstances, but the preaching of divine judgment. To call his gospel the gospel of divine forgiveness as if forgiveness were his chief interest, as if he made more of it than others, is to misinterpret him. Ah, uh, there's a footnote. One. It's at the bottom of this page in small letters. It says, On this and the following paragraph, see my book, God of the Early Christians, chapter one. Okay. So, there you go. I uh, got through a few pages. It's incredible. I can only get through a few pages. And it's already over, way over a half an hour. It's 42 minutes. Actually, I got... I got pretty far. I got four pages. I'm getting better, maybe? I don't know. Well, well, I hope you like this, uh, this book called uh, A History of Christian Thought. I thought it might be interesting because um, later on what caught my attention was chapter 4, the, the Gnostics. The Gnostics. But it also covers other things. Yeah, so... <laughs> it might be a good, like introduction to early the early church this is really really early this is like from jesus um to uh getting getting going get getting getting going uh, is it, well it's let's see this book is volume one so this author uh, wrote volume two two and maybe he's working or was working on three and four and so on he was going to try to get all the history of of christian thought all the way to the present and this is his first volume of course is going in chron chronological order so who knows if he ever finished uh all the volumes needed to get him to the present the present being the 1930s because 
This book was written in 1932. And it sounds like he was a teacher of, of this material. And maybe some people wanted his uh, lectures to be put in a book. So he, he, he was uh, inspired to do something like that and eventually made it into... Yeah, and to try to get it into several volumes to get all of all of Christian thought, uh, the history of it, all in several volumes. I'll, I'll have to look up in uh, in Google to see if uh, if he managed to get um, all the volumes needed to cover all of the history. His last name is Mac Gifford. Let me show it to you. Mac Gifford. A History of Christian Thought, Early and Eastern. So this is volume one of who knows how many volumes. It could be four or five volumes. I'll have to find out. Even he didn't know how many volumes he would need. But he says that he was... He was done with volume two, and it was uh, being published as he was uh, writing the the preface. There's the preface. Maybe you might want to read the preface, so I'll, I'll show it to you, and then you can take a screenshot of it and read it yourself. Oh, so. There's this first page of the preface, and here's the second page of the preface. Let's see if you can capture it. Let's see if I hold it steady so you can take a screenshot of it. There you go. And there's the contents. So it's got me part book one and book two of this volume. So I just started chapter one. So the first book is Christian Thought Until the Time of Iranius. And book two is still in this book. I, I guess he should he should have called it part one and part two instead of book one and book two. Uh, it's in Roman numerals, the chapters. Uh, Christian thought in the East from Clement of Alexandria to John of Damascus. So the interesting chapters, or the ones that I'm looking forward to looking at, is uh, chapter 4, the Gnostics. And, uh, hmm. and chapter 13. The Doctrine of the Trinity. And, of, and 14, the Nicene Council and after. And, uh, and 15, the Doctrine of the Person of Christ. Hmm. There. Yep, that's the way it goes. So, so I hope you like this. Okay. I'm going to upload this to wake up and think clearly so that maybe we can wake up from this uh, ignorance of Christian thought. Maybe we have been thoughtless in understanding Christian thought. So maybe this book will clarify or misunderstandings of Christian thought. Thank you very much. Uh, may this benefit somebody. I think it's benefiting myself. So have a so come back and stay tuned. I guess you would maybe uh, might want to uh, subscribe. So that uh, you can uh, 
catch the next video because the next video might be on this same topic might not actually this this channel wake up and think clearly has uh, saturdays saturday mornings we have a zoom meeting and it's live oh man i have to erase the videos that are on it on it so that it'll record on the cloud uh, I, yeah i forgot to do that i think i can do that now okay that reminds me so uh so uh let's see today is december 12th maybe uh it's a tuesday yeah I think it might be 2023 uh, so uh, let's see the next the next uh, Saturday might be the 17th 12 13 14, or 16th hmm. anyway We'll see. Hmm. So, uh, have a good day. Have a good week. See you next time. In this channel, wake up and think clearly. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to say bye. Uh, in a, in a, uh, looking forward to kind of way, to kind of, uh, inspire, um, folks to come back and visit this channel. Hmm. Well... I've got I've got several books going at the same time. Well, I I got other channels. I got a, a Buddhism for Happiness channel. So you you might want to check that one out too. It's got uh me reading some uh books on Buddhism. So on this channel um, I was reading uh, the first book of the gospel, the book of Matthew, the gospel of Matthew, and I got to chapter 5 and got kind of stuck in it, and then I wandered here and there, and I found this book today on the history of Christian thought and I thought it might be interesting and so there you go so who knows what's going to happen next if I'll continue that book or not there's a lot of other books that are kind of on hold that uh, maybe I'll come back to who knows what's going to happen next and who knows what what the uh, Saturday m morning uh, Zoom meeting is going to be like uh maybe we'll we'll uh we'll have a conversation and see how it goes so i hope you enjoy what we do here what what i'm doing here on this channel uh, i'm going to hit the the um what is it the stop stop recording button and upload this without any editing.